haven't already done so, turn with me once again to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We started last week, we have at least this week, and depending on how far we get, we may have one more week in thinking about submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It is, um, it is a lot bigger topic than some of us uh, think, and, uh, or at least how I used to think about it. And uh, we want to take our time on some things uh, these Sundays before we get into talking about the family. It says very simply, depending on your translation, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, or submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Last week, as we began to think about our, our uh, context, I kind of want to, let's see, no, it won't do it. I thought it was good. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of review before we go to number two here. Uh, remember this verse uh, serves as a pivot point, as it were, uh, between the first part of chapter 5 and the end of chapter 5. Just more recently, we talked about it in terms of the context of being filled with the Spirit. And we said that you would have a song in your heart and that you would be thankful and that you would be filled with the Spirit. That is, submitting to Him, yielding to Him, and one of those signs or uh, manifestations of being filled with the Spirit is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then Paul starts in, wives to your own husbands. And he goes into discussion about the family. And we'll get into that uh, starting well, possibly next week or the week after is my goal. So it's a pivot point for us. We mentioned how submission has a bad reputation. It's often thought of as manifesting weakness. Or someone who is submitting is someone who is sort of milk toast. He doesn't have a spine. He's very timid. Uh, it is outdated. Uh, we believe in the Bible. Oh, you believe in the Bible and the world says, well, that's an outdated and ancient text and we don't do that anymore. It is also sometimes viewed as being a doormat. We talked about a contrast between the world and the church. And the world's view of it, we said, is one toward power. Typically, the world tends toward power and the exercise of power and the grasping hold of authority that isn't properly theirs. And so there is a tendency to overstep one's authority granted by God. And that, of course, uh, is not good. The world tends toward forcing. We mentioned the government. That is the ultimate in coercion and force, right? Whatever the government says, by virtue of an ordinance or by virtue of a law, it says you must obey this. And we force you to do it under threat of uh, paying a fine or going to jail or ultimately prison, that kind of thing. The church, on the other hand, yields to God's providence and persuasion. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty in God. And we yield to Him, trusting in Him and, and His sovereign care for His people and His creation. And we persuade. We leave room for God to act. And so the church tends toward promise. We live by promise. And we patiently wait 
for that promise or promises to be fulfilled. And the church understands that our God fulfills His word of promise according to His time. It's His timetable. And so we are taught, I believe, in the Scriptures to live generationally. Abraham didn't see the total fruition of the promise of God given to him, did he? But he was told, after 400 years, then I'll bring Israel, your seed, back into the land, and so forth. He had to wait. Sometimes we don't see it. But our children see it, you see, generationally. Well, then we started looking at submission in other contexts, and we looked at it in relation to its inability. Inability. And we looked at Romans 8, verse 7, that says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And so there's an inability of the unbelieving world, those whose flesh is, are, are in the flesh, the mind set on the flesh, are set at enmity against God and will not and cannot submit. Romans one twenty one, the history of humanity has been one of refusing to honor God as God and giving thanks to Him. In other words, refusing to submit to the Lord of glory and going their own way. The Jews of Paul's time, he wrote, they were ignorant of the righteousness of God and they sought to establish their own and they did not submit to God's righteousness. And we saw that God's righteousness is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. For faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now we turn to submitting in relation to authority. In relation to authority, we read in Romans 13.1, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And here's key. This is why we do that. You can use the word because. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. The fundamental unit institution in the world is the family, right? Husband and wife. That is fundamental to everything else. And when you get a bunch of families together, maybe they create a governing authority structure over themselves. Uh, Whether it's someone assuming power on his own, or whatever it might be. And God says He establishes those authorities, and therefore we obey them. The living and true God alone is ultimate. Thus, He alone works providentially by His sovereign will. Thus, we submit not because a particular earthly power is worthy or deemed worthy by us, but because God is worthy. And we recognize authority over us, governing authorities over us, because God is ultimate, and it says that He institutes these authority structures among us. Titus 3.1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. 
1 Peter 2.13, be subject for the Lord's sake. There's that phrase again. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. As believers, we seek to help governing authorities to stay within their God-given boundaries. And what is their God-given boundary? To punish evil. It gets a little harder when the government starts calling evil good and good evil, but generally speaking, this is what we are called to do. To help them stay within their God-given boundaries of punishing evil and praising that which is good. We have a problem in our country today, in our society today. There are those there are those who do not believe in God, who say God does not exist, and so what do they say? What do they hold to? Well, if God does not exist, then our fundamental rights can't have been given by Him, right? So who grants them? Well, their argument would be government grants you your rights. However, if government can grant you your rights, what else can they do? Well, yeah, they can take them away. That's right. So we are, especially in so far in the structure of this country, we are allowed to speak up and speak against those things that our government does wrong or that we view to be wrong. Try doing that in totalitarian countries. You won't get very far. Thus, in terms of Titus 3.1 and 1 Peter 2.13, we seek to engage in good works so that the government might look upon it and say, hey, they're doing good. And we need to praise those people. And, and the government praises those who do good. And that praise is for Christ's sake. Think of several organizations. Think of the Red Cross. Christians started the Red Cross. I think it, it might be considered sort of a secular organization at this point. Another organization uh, popularized in song was a Christian organization, the YMCA. Young Men's Christian Association. That's what it was, or supposed to be. Uh, many of the early universities in the history of our country were founded as Christian institutions. And we've lost it. I, I, it, see, it feels like, I guess at my age in the study of history and those kinds of things, it feels like the church has yielded ground in some of those areas. And that's too bad. The primary responsibility of government at any level, punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. We have a monstrosity of a government, in my opinion, that are seeking to do things that are far outside the bounds of their authority. And it just keeps growing. 
And as believers in Jesus Christ, living in this country, we have the opportunity to speak up on several levels. How about in relation to spiritual warfare? Luke 10.17, Jesus had sent out 72 in, in pairs, the disciples, and He sent them out. He gave them instructions, and as they returned, and they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Your name. Imagine that. Demons are subject to Christ. are subject to your name, they said. And that should tell you volumes about how a name, in this context especially, is not a mere label. There were, believe it or not, there were many, many named Jesus, Jesus, uh, during the time of Christ. It was a common name. So it isn't the label these demons were subject to. What were they subject to? Christ and His authority. There was a recognized authority there that the demons were subject to. They are subject to His authority as the Son in the offices of prophet, priest, and king when he came in his first in his humiliation. They were still subject to him. Remember one of them asked at one point, are you here to torment us before the time? He could have spoken, that would have been the end of that. Because he had inherent authority and they were subject to Him. There is no hint of dualism here. Uh, that is, Manichaeism, the equal power and authority of good and evil. Too many people view this battle of good and evil going on, and they're equal in power and authority, and boy, we sure hope good overcomes evil. But for many, especially those belonging to the world, they sort of throw up their hands and they say, well, we don't know for sure. But you and I know, beloved, uh, the Bible presents these things to us pretty clearly that God alone is supreme and that all authority resides in Christ. There is no dualism. And three verses later, as Jesus is speaking to them, He says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. More important than anything else is the promise of eternal life and that it is yours through faith, the instrumentality of faith, laying hold of the promise of God through faith. Trusting in Him. You see, that's where our assurance lies, is, is in Him. It's not in my performance. If it was based on your performance and my performance, guess what? Yeah, well, we'd get a big fat F on our paper, right? It's because of Him. That's where my assurance is. Because of His promise. And I, and I lay hold of that Word and I say, Lord, You are true. Even though every other man is a liar, You remain true and faithful to Your Word. And I will trust in You. I will trust in Your good and precious promise. How about this one? <clears throat> James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A 
What is the road to victory in spiritual warfare? And we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare when we get into Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and following. But what is the road to victory? The road to victory in spiritual warfare is through, it says it right there in the first phrase, yeah, submission to God. Bowing your knee to Him. Through submission to God, then resistance of the evil one, then He flees. As powerful as Satan is, and may be, and we shouldn't make light of him, because he is a powerful enemy, you and I of our own could not defeat him, but who did? Christ, that's right. He cannot stand before the living and true God. You see, no dualism here. He is not equal, in, not even close to being equal with the living and true God. How about our attitudes? in the fear of Christ, or out of reverence for Christ, depending on your translation. Submission in any proper context is a result of one's view of Christ. That's really what it's about. It is about Him. Embracing who He is. Embracing Him in His offices of prophet, priest, and king. Embracing Him as the second person of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Triunity, if you will. And if He is worthy, then I am more likely to be submitting to one another. You see, it comes from my view of Him and His instruction upon my heart and embracing Him, and then I engage in what He says for me to do. The issue of submitting does not have as much to do about my view of others as my view of Christ. If if I find or if you find that you're having difficulty submitting to others in their God-given spheres of authority, proper God-given spheres of authority, then check your view of Christ, you see. So when speaking of submission, one's attitude toward submission is correlative to one's attitude toward Christ. I look to Him and His attitude toward submission. And what was His stance? I look to Him and examine His own actions in submitting and then I follow, remember, the divine pattern. And we were introduced to that at the beginning of chapter 5 in following the divine pattern. And He came, and what did He do? He submitted to the Father's will. And He submitted to the plan for Himself. This is the plan the Father has set before Me, and I will follow it. I will submit to it. And He submitted to it in His humiliation as prophet, priest, and king, to death, even death on a cross, as a sacrifice for His people. Then I thought, well, can I describe it another way? That is, the attitude behind submitting. How do we get there? <clears throat> well, the word I thought of was humility. Humility. Often in uh, all kinds of situations. My counsel is approach it with humility. <clears throat> Maybe you don't have all the answers. 
but we know the One who does. And so you embrace it in a certain way. Not overbearing, lording it over others. If only she would listen to me, everything would be alright. Or if only he would listen to me, everything would be alright. So, I want to go back to James 4, 7, but, but I want to start at verse 6 this time. But he gives more grace. Notice how he couches what comes next. He gives more grace. The Lord gives more grace to you. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. And then what does he do? But gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We cannot engage in spiritual warfare with the wrong attitude. We cannot engage our God in a spirit of pride. But rather, God opposes the proud. You want to be in opposition with God? Then let your pride out. And He will oppose you. But He gives grace to the humble. And He gives more grace. Therefore, submit to God is saying. A demonstration of humility is submitting to God foremost of all. How about 1 Peter 5 and 6? Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Notice it sounds very familiar. It it sounds very similar to what Paul is saying in Ephesians. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. With all humility toward one another, you see. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We need to note that connection there. To clothe ourselves. We talked about what we put on. Well, what Peter says that we add to our closet, so to speak, that we put on ourselves is humility. The world tends toward rejecting humility and lording it over others. I'm going to stand up for myself because if I don't, no one else will. Well, that isn't true. That isn't what God says. He says He will stand up for you if you humble yourself before Him. You see, it's opposite. It's contrary. It's okay to be a contrarian once in a while in the biblical fashion. The proud do not embrace the attitude of submitting. Rather, they embrace self-regard. Instead of regarding others as more important than yourself, I'm more important than everyone else. And if I don't do it, no one else will. They embrace self-exaltation. God gives grace to those who humble themselves. And the way of the divine pattern is not reaching or taking that which is not yours. The world does this. The world reaches out and takes what's not theirs. But you, rather, patiently waiting because God says He may exalt you at the proper time. What would you rather have done? You exalt yourself and be opposed to God? Or humbling yourself, submitting to God, and letting Him be the one who raises you up? So exalting oneself 
flies counter to the attitude of submitting, thus God opposes it. And then submission in relationship to Christ. Submission begins with the truth that all things are subject to Christ. Ephesians 1.22, we have visited there. We're not going to go into all the details concerning it, but he says, as a reminder, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. I think all things means all things in this contest especially. Hebrews 2.8, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see, yet see everything in subjection to him. That is, I think, uh, we don't see everyone voluntarily bowing the knee to Christ and saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have all authority. Of course he does. First Peter 3.22 Who has gone into heaven, that is Christ, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. As head, he sustains all things. As head, he is the source of all things. All things being subject to him means nothing is outside his purview or control. Yet not all voluntarily rank themselves under him. However, and I believe this with all my heart, of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I, I think he's talking about a day when even the unbelieving will do that. Not in belief, but in a recognition that yes, what God said is true. Our submission grows out of the truth that, are, that all things are subject to him. If everything is subject to Him, then what? I am submitting. And I follow what the Bible says, the patterns that it presents, and I submit myself accordingly. Remember, we are called in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel call is the gate through which we enter. Do you think you enter the gate of the gospel call full of pride? No, you enter broken. Knowing your need. Knowing there's nothing you can do about it. But Christ accomplished it. It is the gate through which we enter. The course of our lives changes from one of submitting to the world and of course, we don't like to admit that, and the unbelieving world doesn't like to admit that, yes, indeed, in, in my unbelief, I really am submitting to the world, even though I'm proud and I don't think I'm submitting at all, but I'm following its course that is set before me according to the world and the prince of the power in the air, and we've talked about that. So the course of our lives changed from one of submitting to the world and its ways to Jesus and His ways. He came in His humiliation as prophet, priest, and king. He spoke for God. As priest, He interceded and paid the ultimate price. And as king, He ruled. He had authority in Himself to act and to cast out demons and heal the sick and so on. And he was raised in exaltation as prophet, priest, and king. As such, we are subject to him. And according to Psalm 2, the nations rage and they seek to wage war against him. And he who sits in the heavens does what? He laughs at them.
Our subjection to him is displayed within his body and our submitting to one another out of reverence for this Christ. As we wrap up our thoughts for today, we're going to be able to finish all of this, so that's good. Uh, Submission or submitting is not to be thought of in terms of what the world says we believe about it. The world will cast its net, so to speak, or will broadcast to you, this is how you should view it. This is how you should view things. And we, we ignore what the world says. That is, that is what they say is not what God says. We listen to Him. Part of the problem we have with it is buying in to what the world says about it. However, we view it as part of God's plan. Remember, God has a plan from before the foundation of the world on into eternity future. Part of that plan is subjecting everything to Christ. And we submitted ourselves to our Lord in the Gospel. We submit ourselves to various authorities. We submit ourselves one to another embracing humility. And in the home, reflecting Christ and His church. Our Father in Heaven, we thank You for all that You reveal to us. We thank You for the ministry of the Word, what You teach us, and how You help us, and how You encourage us in the way. We ask, Lord, that You would grant success for Your Word in each of our lives for Your glory. We pray this through Christ and in His name. Amen. All right.